Hello and welcome to this episode of the Global Innovators in Business series. In this series, we bring leaders and innovators from different fields to share their advice and experiences with undergraduate students to provide inspiration and motivation during the pandemic. We're so happy to have with us Keller Ronaldo. Keller is a CEO and co-founder of Zipline, a drone delivery company that transports critical and life-saving products precisely where and when they are needed. This full interview is dedicated to Malaria No More, a nonprofit which mobilizes the political will and global resources required to achieve malaria eradication within our generation. Learn more with a link in the description. Um, but first, I want to show a short video of what Zipline does because you have to see it to believe it. We have an Amazon, please send four units of AP positive blood. She's dying. Welcome, Keller. Thanks. Yes. Um, so with that video just having been played, uh, we have an idea, but, but could you give us a, a, in your version, in your words, what is Zipline do? What does Zipline do? Sure. Uh, you know, Zipline is an instant delivery system for medicine. Um, we knew when we were starting the company, uh, when we were starting to build everything that became Zipline in about 2013, it seemed pretty obvious to us that somebody was going to build an automated instant logistics system for the world. Our backgrounds were in robotics and automation and autonomy. And it just seemed like all of this technology was coalescing to the point where something like that would be possible. But we've always been really fascinated by healthcare logistics. We feel like that's where the real opportunity is. That's where you can have a huge impact on the world. Um, as a result of and the, the reality is billions of people on the planet don't have access to the kinds of logistics that you know, I grew up benefiting from. And as a result of that, uh, people go without access to basic medical products. I mean, five and a half million kids under the age of five lose their lives every year due to lack of access. And uh, that just seems, I mean, it, it has always seemed to us like an insane, it's insane that humanity still makes an excuse and pretends like that problem is not solvable. We feel very strongly that it is solvable, that there are no more excuses, like it's time for us to go solve that problem and that, you know, engineering and technology can have a, have a, have a big role to play. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of, you know, that, that's our company in a nutshell. We you know, partner with governments as well as with hospital systems and other healthcare companies to make it possible for them to essentially teleport whatever medical products are needed um, instantly to any hospital, health facility, or even eventually home. Um, when a patient needs something. Mm. Um, this is one of the first companies that, that I've had the opportunity to learn about, which truly combines a, a mission, a social mission with technology and then leverages it in this perfect way that, that brings change in, in the developing world and around other places in the developed world too. Um, but before, we'll definitely, we'll go into this in much more detail. But to start off, you chose Malaria No More as a charity you wanted to dedicate this interview to. What is it about and why did you want to dedicate this interview to, to that specifically? Yeah, I've been really interested in effective altruism over the last, um, over the last 
a couple years. And I think that that whole philosophy is, is fascinating. You know, they talk about how if you were walking by, like, on the side of a road, a, a lake, and you see a child drowning in the lake, and, like, imagine the experience of, like, jumping in and grabbing that child and pulling them out and saving their life. And, and that seems like such an extreme thing. It's a, something that you would obviously do and B, like imagine the impact that that would have on your life emotionally, knowing that you had saved that child's life. And I think this, you know, this, this philosophy is really kind of showing that actually like anybody growing up in a wealthy part of the world has that opportunity like multiple times a month, if not multiple times a year through, um, through you know, making donations to effective charities like Malaria No More. It's known as one of the most, like, it's basically the biggest bang for your buck charities on earth in terms of saving lives. It, you, you know, buying bed nets to prevent kids from getting malaria has a huge impact on saving lives. And uh, so anyway, it's just, it's something that I really admire. I think it's one of the best charities on earth. And um, I learned about it by learning about effective altruism. Mm. Yeah, I, it, people who watch this show a lot might realize that a lot of the charities that we do dedicate these interviews to are effective altruism charities. Sometimes it's because um, the, I, I read a book by Peter Singer who, who talks about the effective altruism movement. And sometimes when the um, guest doesn't have a charity in mind, we, we bring out a effective altruism charity because we, we think that it can provide the best uh, overall benefits in, with, with for a general audience. So I completely, completely agree with that. And starting from that point, um, I'm sure you read so much. And actually I know this because I listened to your father's podcast and he said, when you were a child, while everybody else was doing other things, you were constantly reading. So I, I was very, very curious. When, is there any book from when you read when you were very young that continue to stay in your mind and to this day and have and somewhat influenced you in your decisions in the future? I mean, a couple come to mind. Uh, I was you know, really into science fiction as a kid. Uh, and it's always amazing to me that I actually don't know very many people who read science fiction today. <laughs> and I think it's like an incredible loss because science fiction is just kind of dreaming about what the world might look like. And it seems really valuable if you're interested in building new things in the world to read a lot of science fiction. Um, I grew up reading like Foundation Trilogy by Isaac Asimov, which is a, a classic and something I recently reread, as well as uh, Ender's Game, which I probably still read. Like, I don't know, I, I've read that book many, many, many times. Um, and I mean, Dune, like there's so many awesome books. One, one, one that I read recently, Three Body Problem, um, is one of the first major, I think, science fiction trilogies to come out of China and is possibly like the best science fiction book I've ever read. Um, yeah, I, I love reading science fiction because I think it's it's just, I also think that at least books as opposed to movies are still more in like the hopeful genre of like, what do we want the future to look like rather than just like another apocalyptic, you know, robot apocalypse or whatever, you know, sci-fi movie that we watch that makes people feel like technology is out to kill them. Of course, each book has a different portrayal, but on average, how far is science fiction behind the curve of what potentially could happen in the world? I mean, yeah, it really depends on the book. I think it, it you know, there's some, some near-term sci-fi that I think is often trying to predict things that are happening just a few years out. Um, so I don't know, I, I think it, yeah, it really depends a lot. But I think what I would say is so much of the stuff, I mean, when you read like Isaac Asimov, which was, you know, he was writing, I think in like 1940 and 1950, mm -hmm. I mean, so much of that stuff has actually come true. That's one, of, and, and, I, and I would say a lot of this sci-fi that I read today that I really like is the stuff, it's, it's not predicting like fundamental scientific progress, it's more predicting just like weirdness and like <laughs> decreasing stigma around things that you just wouldn't do today. And I actually think that's, that is often like the right way to predict the future. It's just that like these things that seem really weird or uncool to us today um, or that are stigmatized will be normal three or four or five years from now. Like watching people play video games online. I remember as a kid wa like watching on YouTube, the first time YouTube came out, I was able to watch like replays of pros, like South Korean pros playing StarCraft. 
And I remember being like really embarrassed by that, thinking like, this is a weird thing, like watching other people play video games and no one thought that was a thing. And now obviously like, it just kind of takes a generational shift to be like, that's what everybody does <laughs> at massive scale, like bigger than the Super Bowl. So I don't know. I think, I think a lot of these things are not about fundamental technolo technological progress as much as they are just like shifting stigma and like acceptability. And that's so interesting because your career later on, right after graduation, you, you worked on a startup that's, that's almost like a robotics company with an iPhone um, that can be controlled by an iPhone. And then now you're developing a drone company, uh, the, the first in, of its kind. So in some way, your, your backgrounds or your, your learnings of all of these science fictions are coming true through your own hands. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I suppose so. Like, I think, you know, we've always just had this sense that like, it's, you know, cool to go on an adventure and try to build something new for the world. Um, you know, the, I think Zipline particularly has been really focused on just, I think we've been willing to take risk and go into parts of the world that most people um, didn't think you could build a technology company in. And we've wanted to focus on like the biggest, most ambitious problems we can imagine. Um, and yeah, I think so far so good. You know, I, I think it turns out that although it can be harder to raise money for a company that's starting in Africa and you know, it can be trickier from a travel perspective, there are some huge advantages to it. Like a big reason that Zipline's been able to build the, the team that we were able to build is that uh, the, like people want, especially people graduating from college today, I think a lot of people are not that excited to go try to help, you know, a massive search giant make 0.1% more on ads that they serve to people every day. I think people um, generally want, like uh, people want to work on something that they're proud of that they can tell their grandkids about. And I think that um, this is the reason that mission-driven companies tend to be able to assemble the strongest teams. Um, and that's definitely been a secret weapon for Zipline. I completely agree. What did you want to do during, during college? I had no idea. I had no idea what I wanted to do. You know, I, I, um, I studied, my, my concentration at Harvard was called social studies, which was kind of like a combination of economics and sociology. Uh, I built computers made of RNA and DNA that operated within human cells. I was working in a biotech lab, um, ended up publishing that in Nature Biotechnology. Uh, we called them molecular automata. And the goal was to design these like doctors that could be making uh, decisions on a cell by cell basis based on gene transcription. And so you know, I had a sense, I mean, for how quickly technology was advancing. I also had a sense that like that was probably what I was working on was a little too frontier. Like I, I didn't really see a path to turning that into a company in, in, in the near term. Um, but after I graduated, as I started learning more and more about robotics, it seemed like, wow, you know, it seemed like there was this opportunity to go build like the first great robotics company mm -hmm. in the world. Cause there was so much technology that was, that was progressing rapidly. Like all the components that you find in a phone, you know, like a, um, magnetometer, Wi-Fi, cellular antenna, um, you know, microprocessor, like all the stuff, like a general IMU, all of those things are the ultimate, are the things you actually need to build powerful autonomous vehicles or robots. It's just, I think people hadn't quite figured out that like the scale of the self, the, the smartphone industry suddenly made it the case that we were probably ready. Like the world was ready for a robotics company that could, that could really get to global scale. And so that was like just this intuition that we had around 2011, 2012, when we started working in this space. You spent, if I'm not mistaken, uh, two and a half months in consulting right after graduation and then quit to become a rock climber. Uh, tell us a little bit about this transition and how did you make this decision? I think that unfortunately, you know, one of the things that I, I found pretty confusing, you know, graduating from school, they had Office of Career Services, which was supposed to like help you figure out what you were going to do next. And I definitely gave a lot I, I, I listened, I think, to Office of Career Services rather than listening to my heart. You know, there was this expectation like, oh, it's all about burnishing your resume and, you know, you'll set yourself up for success in your career by going and you know, working at a consulting firm or an iBanking firm. That's like the obvious best thing that you could do. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think I bought into that. Um, I, 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 
I mean, if anybody was not meant for that life, it was probably me. I'm, you know, I just would not be <laughs> ideal for that in, in a thousand different ways. And, uh, and yet I think that a lot of these Office of Career Services are actually, I mean, I think they're actually kind of confusing kids and giving bad advice in many cases. Um, or at the very least, they're trying to fit everybody into like a mold. Um, and so, yeah, after a couple months, I, I kind of realized that, that really wasn't what I wanted to do. Uh, I had an offer to go rock climb full time. Like I had some sponsors who were willing to pay for me to go travel the world and um, you know, compete and explore. And that seemed like a good thing to do. Like I wasn't sure I was ever going to get that opportunity any other time in my life. So I, um, I decided to go for it. And in many ways, like me, you know, leaving a corporate job and just going and being completely on my own and like traveling the world gave me a lot more of, I think, the freedom and perspective that made it easy to start thinking like, well, what would be really cool to like build for the world and what would be important and how would I be proud to spend my life? I think without that year, I, um, I probably would not have started Zipline. If you could go back to college and re-decide um, or re re invent how you decided what to go into, how would you do it? And how would you advise students like us to, to do so? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the biggest, like the thing I'm most grateful for coming from college is the opportunity I had to work with this amazing professor, his name was Kobe Benenson, um, on these molecular automata. I think that for me was like me totally falling in love with technology and like advanced technology, almost like sci-fi, like these things even possible. You know, this, we were building these plasmids that would provide the blueprints for the computers to human cells. And then human cells could actually build the computers made of RNA and DNA. And then like these computers could actually do Boolean logic and make decisions about what should happen in a cell. That seemed amazing and so cool. And it just made me realize like you can create new technology from scratch with the right idea. Um, and we also built a rock climbing wall at Harvard. Uh, and that was this interesting entrepreneurial experience where everybody told us it was impossible, we were wasting our time, don't bother, no one will ever pay for it, no one will ever, ever allow it. And we just ignored them and kind of went and did it. Um, you know, <laughs> debatable whether we had permission to do it, but like once it was built, um, the administration wasn't really able to shut it down um, and actually started supporting it. It turned into this awesome community. And I think so. that was this other experience I had of like getting to build something from scratch, like try to assemble a team around something, try to paint a vision and also kind of realizing that like no one will ever give you permission if you ask. That was probably a fundamental truth that I took away from undergrad is like if you ask for permission, th the answer is always no. So better to just like kind of go for it and hope for forgiveness. I've, I've been given forgiveness more often than I've been given permission in life. Um, I think my biggest piece of advice, you know, I, I think a lot of kids go into college being told by their parents or by being told being told by teachers, like, study what you're passionate about. And I actually think this is terrible advice. I think it leads to tons of kids studying things that are kind of useless and getting degrees that are kind of useless. And I think there's this snooty attitude of like, well, you shouldn't just focus on like what you know, would allow you to get a good job or anything like that. You should follow your heart. But like the reality is that leads to tons of kids making bad decisions about like what they study in college. Like college is this amazing opportunity to build a set of tools that you need in your life to have the impact you want to have before you die. Mm. And I think a lot of kids get this bad advice about like, do what you're passionate about. And this leads to like many, 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 many students studying psychology, for example, where like more kids graduate from college with degrees in, in psychology than there are total jobs as psychologists in the United States. So like every year, more kids are graduating than there are total jobs. This is a problem. And I think it comes from like the fact that we're encouraging kids to not make practical decisions. And that's stupid. Like, actually, in my opinion, it's a really good idea to figure out what's the impact you want to have on the world. Like, that's the question we should be asking um, students who are in college. Like, what is the impact you think you want to have on the world? And there's so many different ways you can answer that question. But once you can answer that question, then college should be about cool. Like, what is the set of tools and skill sets you need in order to have that impact once you graduate? I think that is how kids, like, that's how students should think about you know, using college. And I kind of wish someone had given me that advice. I think I got lucky, but I, um, I you know, I, that, that's, that's the thing that I think was, I wish someone had told me. That's great advice. Uh, recently, we talked to Ethan Brown, who's a uh, founder and CEO of Beyond Meat. And he said, 
the changing moment in his life was his dad asking him, what do you want to do in this world when you, uh, after you graduate? And then he decided energy and climate change was the thing. And I think that is the question that, that is so important for everybody to answer during college. Um, and okay, going into, going into robotics and, okay, so you're doing rock climbing and you're attending these major competitions and how did that lead into robotics and leader zip line? I mean, it's a long story. Like, you know, I was after, after a year of, of climbing full time, starting to feel like my brain was possibly atrophying. Um, you know, I was in really good shape, but I wasn't like challenging myself mentally. Um, you know, some of my best friends from, um, from high school and actually middle school were starting to like tinker with robots. And um, it, I, I was just fascinated by it. Like, it seemed like, it seemed to me coming from biotech where we had been working on these molecular automata, which were really cool, but I still thought it was probably like 10 or 15 or 20 years out. It seemed to me like robotics was a little closer in. It felt like there was an opportunity that we could actually go build something quickly. We could build a product that we could get into the real world in less than a year that, that people would actually pay us for, which was that first iPhone robot that you described. Um, and it was also just fun. And to be honest, like it was never even that plan. Like we weren't intentionally creating a company. We didn't have like big plans of building this global company, which you know it has now become. Um, we're just hanging out in an apartment with friends, like building something that was kind of goofy, but also people were willing to pay us 150 bucks for. And so we were like mailing these robots out to people all over the country. And um, we ended up raising, I think $150,000 on Kickstarter, which seemed like a massive amount of money to us at the time. Um, yeah, I mean, I think to a certain degree, you know, there's no planning for this sort of stuff. You're just sort of like naively stumbling into it and just like following, following your heart and, and kind of intuition and saying like, this seems like a cool thing to do. Actually, I mean, so many amazing companies are weird enough on their face that you kind of have to be a weirdo to even explore them. Like I think Airbnb is famous for like most of even the first people who invested in Airbnb said like, people are doing this? Like what's wrong with them? You know, like this is totally weird. And I think a lot of times the best companies are created in that way. I think it also speaks to what I was speaking before, like that idea of stigma, like stigma, you know, that was a stigmatized thing, like building um, or like living, like going and traveling and staying in someone else's house or like staying in a room in some stranger's house. That was like a super weird thing uh, five years ago or eight years ago. And I think when we were starting Zipline, starting a robotics company was a super weird thing. It was like, there were no hardware startups that were succeeding. No investors wanted to fund them. Um, so yeah, I think you just have to be a little bit of a, you just have to be weird about it. And like, I, had we insisted on having like a super clear plan and business model and all of that, like we never would have gotten started. Another person, uh, when you were telling the story of like creating the, the climbing wall, it reminded me so much. I recently read the book, uh, Delivering Happiness by Tony Shea. And I know Tony Shea had some parts in, in, in your journey too. Um, yeah, that's right. Tony Shea serve as a mentor or, or, or help you in that process? Um, when I was, so I, uh, at Harvard, I lived at, in Quincy House, which is, you know, one of the big dorms there. And that was actually the dorm that Tony lived in when he was an undergrad. And Tony was, Tony was always about 12 years older, I think 12 years older than I was. Um, uh, and for the viewers, uh, Tony Shea is the CEO and founder of Zappos, or, or the, actually the CEO of Zappos. And then before yeah. that, well, um, Link Exchange. Founder of Link Exchange, sold, sold Link Exchange to Microsoft and then sold Zappos to Amazon. I mean, you know, when I was graduating from school, uh, I, I knew of Tony and, you know, he was just like this icon of like, wow, you know, you can go be an entrepreneur. And it was this totally different story than I was hearing from Office of Career Services that like what Tony had done seemed absolutely mind blowing to me. Um, and so I read his book when I was climbing full time, traveling the world. Um, and then I was in Vegas. And so I just wrote Tony an email. And I was starting to get interested in robotics at that time. I, Tony got back to me right away. and was like, yeah, sure. You know, we're, we're like, I'm interested. Like you should hang out. And like, he had rented like the entire, this entire apartment building, essentially. He had many, many, many apartments. So he just gave us an apartment that we moved into, um, which we promptly like turned into a small robot factory and totally trashed. 
Um, but, you know, Tony was definitely like a free spirit and he was just, I think he always wanted to build these communities. Um, and yeah, it was this crazy little community in Las Vegas where we started the company. Tony um, invested in us in our seed round of financing. He wrote $500,000 seed stage check into, into what at that time was Remotive has now become Zipline. Um, yeah, he took a huge bet on us and um, he had a huge impact. You know, I, I think Tony was like the counterbalancing force to Office of Career Services saying like, it's okay to be a weirdo. You can go work on something totally crazy. And certainly, you know, living in Vegas with a bunch of other like kind of misfits and like ragtag startups was, um, it was a, it was a, it was a low, it was a low pressure environment. Not, I don't know, not a low pressure, but it was just, it was a weird enough environment where it's like, everything is weird about that. You know, we were like living in this person, like living in one of Tony's apartments, like, uh, you know, and he gave us some money and we're building robots and shipping them all over the world. And meanwhile, you're like in Vegas, which is a weird place to live to begin with. Um, yeah, I think, I, you know, it, Tony uh, had a huge impact and um, it was actually Tony's co-founder, um, or, or the person who was COO at um, at Zappos, Alfred Lin, who was his best friend at, at, in Quincy House at Harvard. Um, Alfred it, is now a partner at Sequoia. Sequoia led Zipline Series A. Alfred joined Zipline's board. Um, Alfred, to this day, has been probably the mentor who's had the biggest impact on my growth as a leader. And um, yeah, so Tony, Tony, Tony was amazing. And obviously, you know, it's really um, tragic that he's no longer with us. Yes. Yeah. His legacy is, is amazing. And if you have a chance, uh, the last chapter of Tony's book and the entire book, but especially the last chapter um, tells a very, very beautiful story. Um, okay. And then if you could, um, could you share an analogy of the journey of building Zipline with rock climbing? How, how does these two, uh, with the ideas and, and the lessons you learned through rock climbing? I think that there's one thing that uh, is often that, that is a good parallel. And that is that you know, the kind of rock climbing I do, which you know, I was probably best at sport climbing, which means you're going out to this cliff that is probably like 100 feet tall and it usually looks blank and extremely overhanging. Um, for the like, most difficult routes in the world, mm -hmm. it looks totally impossible. And usually the more impossible the route looks, the more beautiful it looks. Cause it's like, an ex it's like a piece of art almost, you know, cause it's almost smooth and beautiful colors and looks like no human could possibly scale it. Mm -hmm. um, and the overwhelming, you know, urge to try that thing, I mean, it's both because of how impossible it is, but it also means that the experience of rock climbing, something like that, one of the hardest routes in the world is basically just constantly falling. You know, you, you like get on the route, climb, fall, obviously you have a rope that's catching you. Um, and you might try for years and fail on a route before you succeed. In fact, through college, I was trying this route called China Beach at a place called Rumney. And I tried that route like my freshman year, sophomore year, junior year. I mean, I was like, I must have fallen on that route 200, 300, 400, 500 times. And like, you know, in the early days, it's often kind of fun. Once you actually start getting closer and closer, you get like, you put, start putting tons of pressure on yourself. It actually becomes not fun. Like you're really frustrated when you can't do it. And um, I think that to be a good, to be good at that, you have to be, you have to find like enjoyment in the failure, basically. You have to just, it's like about the process. It's about the fun of like letting your body adapt and figuring out the moves and the technique and um, you have to be okay failing. And that is definitely is 100% one of the universal truths of I think trying to build a company. The reality is I had no idea what I was doing when we started the company. And so I've been basically falling on my face super publicly in front of the team, in front of our investors, like over and over and over and over again. You sort of have to be willing to constantly pick yourself back up and be like, okay, well, you know, that sucks. But like, now I have a better idea. Let's go try this. And in some ways, I actually think you have to be shameless about it because like you're asking the team to trust you. Then you clearly demonstrate that you don't deserve their trust because you just totally screwed it up and made the wrong decision. And then you're like, all right, I have a better idea. Please trust me again. Let's go do this. Um, yeah, I think that like willingness to fail is is a key thing. It's, it's like you find in the best rock climbers and probably the best entrepreneurs. And I think, unfortunately, I would say, you know, speaking to, you know, uh, um, Penn students or, or like college students more broadly, I think the university system 
tries as hard as possible to beat that out of you. Like the entire educational system is designed to create kids who will do what is expected of them and never fail. Like as long as you go through school, you can do nothing special, nothing extraordinary. As long as you don't fail, if you do what's expected of you and can just get an A by doing like, you know, whatever is expected every single time, that can be like an extraordinary academic career. You can get into the best college in the world. You can then graduate from the best college in the world and go to one of the you know best jobs in the world. But like the reality is once you graduate from school, nobody cares anymore about how often you fail. Like no one's keeping score. There's no one giving you grades. You can then literally go fail 10 times trying to do something new. Like the real rewards are in doing something fundamentally new for the planet. Um, or at least like, you know, that's what I wanted to do. Um, but doing something fundamentally new, creating a company from scratch, creating a new kind of technology, whatever, making an awesome movie. I think you know, the fundamentally creative pursuits um, require failure. And I think school teaches us to like fear it and avoid it. And that's exactly probably the wrong mindset to have when you're graduating from college if you want to make a difference in the world. To destigmatize failure, is there one failure that you remember very vividly in your experience that, that you learned? I mean, there, there, yeah, there are so many, so, so many. <laughs> like, and I, uh, trying to think about what something that you know, we could really go into detail. I mean, I think, you know, when we originally launched in Rwanda, we thought we really knew what we were doing in 2016 and we had signed this contract with them. You know, we went in meeting with the Minister of Health and I remember saying, hey, we'll deliver, you know, all these different medical products to every hospital and health facility in the country. Mm -hmm. And I remember at the time she said, Keller, shut up, just do blood. Like blood would be enough because 50% of transfusions are going to our moms with postpartum hemorrhaging, 30% are going to our kids. It's a logistics nightmare. Um, you have platelets, packed red blood cells, plasma and cryoprecipitate. Platelets only last six days. Uh, and have to be constantly agitated and stored at room temperature. Plasma has to be frozen, packed red blood cells are refrigerated. Plus then you've got all, like many of those are types. So you have A, B, A, B, and O and positive and negative RH factor. Like it's a logistics nightmare. And, and, and so, you know, she kind of wanted us to go focus on blood and serve 21 hospitals. I remember saying, okay, well, that's a lot smaller than we were hoping, but we'll do it. And then when we launched, we realized like not only had she saved the company by having us focus on something that was much smaller than we were originally gonna bite off, but like we had no idea how to do that. 2016 and 2017 were very difficult years for the company where the company almost failed um, for several months where we were hoping to be serving a lot of hospitals. We only served one. We we're just serving one hospital that was right over the hill and nothing was going right. We didn't know how to integrate with the national healthcare system. We didn't know how to integrate with the Civil Aviation Authority. We didn't really know how to do pre-flight checks correctly or data logging. Um, the vehicle wasn't as reliable as we wanted it to be. So we were paralanding a lot more often than we wanted, which is a system that we have on board that allows the plane to basically gently bring itself to the ground if it can't make it home. Mm -hmm. uh, that was incredibly trying and scary. And, and definitely, I think, had we not had like the team and the culture that the company had at that time, we, it, we definitely would have died. Um, so yeah, I think that's like, you know, I don't know, I actually wouldn't necessarily frame that as a mistake, but certainly that was like a very, very scary time where the, where the company almost failed. I mean, the biggest mistakes I've made at Zipline are probably just around, um, hiring, you know, like we, we, you try so hard to find like the right person for the role and sometimes you get it wrong. And then often you, it's really easy to like, if, especially if you're a nice person, I mean, asking someone to leave the team is incredibly painful and emotionally distressing. And often you can try to make all kinds of excuses in your own mind about like why it's your fault or why you're not doing a good enough job managing or like that person wasn't set up for success. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's incredibly painful. Like when you, when you get that decision wrong and the whole team is really relying on you to get the decision right and you get the decision wrong and then you kind of have to like come to terms with it, like have a difficult conversation with that person, ask them to leave explain to the team why you screwed up and why they should now trust you again to like go and find the right person. Um, been through that many, many times. I would say you know, that's definitely one of the examples of where you just sort of have to be like, yep, I just totally embarrassed myself and fell on my face. Now I'm picking myself out and fell on my face. Now I'm picking myself up out of the mud and just like moving forward. Well, yeah, both examples are, are tremendous. I know the first few months in Rwanda, 
were so difficult um, for, for, for his client. And you started off with one hospital, but now, and then in 2018, I think you've expanded to the entire Rwanda, and now you're going into uh, Nigeria, you're going into Ghana, you're, you're going into other places. Uh, U.S. Partnering with the U.S. as well. Um, what, what, what is the future of drone delivery, instantaneous drone delivery? What, what, what do you see in five to 10 years? Or for Zipline and for other companies as well? I think it's hard for me to see five or 10 years out. I'm, I'm like mainly focused on seeing, you know, one or one or two years out right now. Um, I mean, you know, right now Zipline serves about 25 million people. I think in the next two years, we'll be serving over hundred million people, which, you know, we're super. I mean, these are people who depend on us every day with their lives and the lives of their loved ones. I mean, today Zipline delivers 75% of the national blood supply of Rwanda outside the capital city. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, we've been able to get, I think, this technology to a scale that most people thought was totally impossible. And I also think there's this incredibly cool paradigm shift because generally, I think investors and entrepreneurs expected that advanced technology like robotics will start in the U.S. and then maybe trickle its way out to other countries. And actually, this is like a fundamental paradigm shift where, you know, countries like Rwanda, which are smaller, less wealthy, but like very innovative and hungry and willing to do new things and, you know, can move quickly from a regulatory perspective in order to make it possible for new technology to get started and to scale. Like these countries are starting to establish major competitive advantages in things like autonomous vehicles. And right now the U.S. is learning from the precedent that was set by Rwanda and Ghana. Um, You know, today we have autonomous aircraft that are flying throughout the sky in both countries, like on a national at a national scale. And meanwhile, most people in the US think drone delivery is technologically impossible, let alone, you know, happening happening at scale. So I think, um, yeah, I I think, you know, some of the things I can predict for the future is that this technology is going to, I mean, we are gonna expand and continue to grow very rapidly. I think that the technology, there's gonna be a big mindset shift in the next year for sure, where people realize that it's possible. And then suddenly everybody realizes like, oh my God, what's our strategy when it comes to this industry? Like we also need, you know, if, if you're a big company providing some kind of logistics service in the US, you're going to need a plan. You're going to need a strategy when it comes to instant delivery because everything is going to shift or at least a lot of things are going to shift in this direction. Um, but I also think uh, something I can predict for the future is that a lot more important technology companies, especially when it comes to kind of like radical tech, radical or advanced technology are going to start outside the US. As a U.S. citizen, that kind of bums me out. But as a global citizen, I think that's amazing news for the world because it's a sign that I, I think, you know, some of the more the smaller, more innovative, hungrier countries in the world are going to be able to lead um, in this area. And I think that's, you know, it's almost inevitable because so much of the innovation that you see over the last 20 or 30 years in the United States has actually happened on the Internet, which is actually weirdly unregulated. Like if you look across all industries in the U.S., the vast majority of those industries are regulated to one degree or another. It's actually unique about the internet that it's pretty fundamentally unregulated. And I think that that is the reason that so many companies have been able to move as fast as they have in the US. But when you start looking at like 3D printing houses or you know life extension therapies or autonomous aircraft or autonomous ground-based vehicles, like all of those technologies are fundamentally, like it's a hugely complicated regulatory problem. And I think it's more likely that those technologies will start in countries that um, that can move quickly and can and can basically reconfigure regulations um, uh, based on you know how how to basically learn from that kind of a new technology and how to get it to scale. Yeah, we've recently interviewed a cell-based meat company in Singapore, and Singapore has this amazing policy that supports like alternative meats and cell-based meats. So there is countries around the world that are like quickening their regulation process to make these new technologies more, more possible for yep. us. And that will be a huge- And I don't want to give up on the US, by the way. Like, I still think the US has a really important role to play here. And obviously, you know, Zipline is now launching in the US and has worked with a number of different hospital systems here. Um, so I, I do think the US is being a fast follower here. So, you know, credit where credit is due. Yes. Um, and then how can we uh, students be a part of this industry in the future? Uh, the drone industry and instantaneous delivery. 
um, in the five, 10 years as we're graduating, how can we find ourselves in that space? Yeah, I think, I mean, well, first of all, I mean, Zipline has like 100 open roles online. So, you know, from engineering to operations and new deployments and uh, sales, uh, there's, you know, the, the team is growing really, really fast. Zipline is currently, I think, a little over 400 people, and um, we will almost double in the next 12 months. So, I, you know, definitely we're hiring. Don't be shy about, you know, sending us an email, checking out the, the jobs on our website. Um, but I think more broadly, I mean, there are many, many startups out there that are working on really exciting, important problems for humanity. I think that probably a lot of the best engineering talent on earth, graduating from the best schools on earth, get bad advice from the equivalent of Office of Career Services and feel like because they've for 15 years of their educational lives been taught that like they should avoid failure and mitigate risk and just like burnish their resume wherever possible. I think a lot of students graduating from college feel that they need to go into, you know, a large company that will basically, I don't know, you know, get them ahead in their career. And the reality is there are a whole bunch of other paths that don't look like that. Um, and a lot of those paths are really exciting, high potential, high growth, like just challenging. And, and also I, I think, um, I just know looking back at Zipline, like I'm super, it's super fulfilling to get to build something new for the world and do it with a small team of people who are like deeply committed to a mission and a vision. Um, and so I would just make sure you know, if you're graduating, make sure to at least go interview with a couple of companies like that. So that at the very least, I mean, cause look, it's not for everyone. It's also really stressful, really difficult, super painful a lot of the time. Um, and people are just at different points in their lives. So I'm not saying it's for everyone, but I do think it's a good idea to at least make sure to go explore that. And, um, you know, there, there are so many companies out there that are doing important things. I mean, check out, you know, go look at any top investor like Sequoia or Andreessen Horowitz and just like look at their list of portfolio companies. You'll find a ton of really cool, innovative young companies that are trying to do important things for the world and, you know, shoot emails to 10 of them and, and go interview and find out about what they're doing and how you can help. Um, I think that probably a lot of really great engineers graduating from schools maybe don't even consider it as an option. And um, that's kind of a tragedy. And not just engineers, obviously. Also, like, whatever your background is, like, startups don't, aren't just hiring engineering. They're also hiring people into operations and sales and HR. Like, there are a ton of different things to, to focus on. Got it. Yeah, 100%. And, and we'll now go into the, the Q&A section of the interview. And, okay, cool. Uh, one of the questions we had is, why did you choose Rwanda to start this journey? Yeah, I mean, I, I would actually, I mean, in some ways Rwanda chose us. Like we, we had a sense that we needed to find a country that would really partner deeply with us, um, that could move quickly from a regulatory perspective, where we felt like, uh, there was a big impact that we could have on the healthcare system. We were also looking for a country with a centralized healthcare system. That's kind of a big thing. In the, in the U.S., we don't have that. Whereas, you know, in most African countries, you can actually work directly with the Ministry of Health and then serve all hospitals and health facilities in the country, which is a huge advantage. Mm -hmm. um, so I was spending a lot of time in East Africa. We were actually mainly focused on Tanzania. Um, around the time, a, a journalist actually introduced me to the president of Rwanda because he had found out what we were doing. He's like, President Kagame would be really into this. Um, and so introduced us and I, I, you know, the president was willing to make this huge bet on this team of like, you know, 12 or 15 nerds who frankly had no idea what we were doing at the time. Um, but I think he kind of shared our vision and he was willing to take a little bit of a flyer on us and say, go for it. Like, you know, if you can do this, this would be really powerful. Um, and, you know, he not only took that bet on us, but he then gave us the time we needed to figure it out. Because as I mentioned, like for the first several months of operating, we were not fulfilling the contract. Like we were totally struggling to just serve one hospital, let alone the 21 that we had promised. And I, instead of just saying, you guys are idiots, you don't know what you're doing. I mean, he and the Minister of Health and, and, and you know, the rest of the government kind of stood by us and said, okay, we get it. Like, it's hard, you know, figure it out. And uh, over the course of a year, we did figure it out. You know, it took us like, I don't remember, I think it took us at least six months, maybe eight 
just to serve that first hospital successfully. And now over the last three years, we've expanded from that one hospital to today's appliance contractor to serve over 3,000. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's like, you know, there's really all of those things, you know, the fact that Rwanda was a small country that was investing heavily in infrastructure, technology, and healthcare um, made it a really amazing place to build this technology and show what it was capable of. I actually, I think it's quite possible that had Zipline not, had, had, had Zipline launched in any other country other than Rwanda, we may have failed as a company. Wow. Come on. Um, yeah, Rwanda, uh, there's so many videos, uh, if you look at YouTube, of like the government of Rwanda and how their, their system is so unique and so, so efficient. Um, so it's such an interesting place to, to start a business. Um, and then the last question is, how has COVID-19 affected Zipline? And, and we've seen tremendous growth in the US and other places, but how has COVID-19 played a part in that? I mean, when the pandemic hit in March, you know, we, we had no idea. I mean, our, my, my sense was, you know, we probably needed to like, you know, reduce the size of the team. We needed to go into survival mode. It was not clear to me that any of our customers were going to stick by our side. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't know if Zipline would ever be able to raise money from investors again. It sort of seemed like the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. uh, and then just a few months later, I think it was suddenly the exact opposite was becoming clear because suddenly every country on earth was making healthcare logistics a national priority. And not just healthcare logistics, but so many of these hospital systems suddenly needed to figure out a way of extending the reach of the healthcare system directly into the home. Uh, because you have all these elderly, chronically ill or immunocompromised patients who you know, previously they may have been going in to get treated in a hospital. Now those are the exact people you need not to go into the hospital so they don't get infected. Um, I think just so much of healthcare is maybe, you know, it needed a good crisis to transform because now we see so many of these hospital systems kind of going through 10 years of digital transformation in one year that, you know, they thought they had more time, but now they're like, okay, we don't have any time. We're just going to do it all this year. And that's actually a really good thing for healthcare. And it's been you know, an amazing opportunity for Zipline to show how we can help, how we can deliver things instantly to primary care facilities or directly to homes in a contactless way. Um, we, you know, enabling decentralized care, treating people closer to where they live. Um, these are trends that were already happening in healthcare, but now they've been accelerated by a factor of 10. Mm -hmm. um, and so all of these things, you know, led to Zipline having by far like the most successful business year we've ever had last year. And I think this year we'll, you know, we will, um, be, you know, exceed that by, by many multiples again. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's been a very counterintuitive thing about the pandemic, which is that, and maybe you see a similar thing in World War II, where, you know, having this like national threat that kind of like unifies our focus and causes us to really innovate because we're desperate and we don't have any other options can actually be, I mean, obviously it's, it's a tragedy, like war is a tragedy and a pandemic is a tragedy, but you know, there are silver linings. And I think the silver linings are that it kind of like kicks us out of our um, complacency and into like overdrive mode to go build the things that are required to make the world a more equal or more healthy place. And I, I do see a lot of those things happening. I think a lot of technology is progressing quickly that will make humanity more resilient to these kinds of pandemics in the future. And, and also, I mean, things like Zipline, I mean, Zipline can be very helpful for the pandemic, but also we will enable these countries and societies to be more resilient and equal from a healthcare access perspective in the long run. Um, so I think we will see, there will be dividends of the things that we're doing in response to COVID-19 for decades to come. Yeah, major disruptions, almost incentivize disruptors to, to, to take over uh, more and more. Um, thank you so much, Keller. This has been such an amazing conversation. Um, check out Malaria No More, and it's in the link in the description. And also um, check out Zipline and all the things that they are doing. Um, thank you so much for joining. This is so fascinating, and I can't wait to see what Zipline and you and the entire team will do. Um, thank you. Thank you.